The verdict on John Swallow. Maybe get a good night's sleep for the first time in a couple years. In depth coverage on KSL News Radio. So good to have you along on today's Doug Wright Show here at KSL News Radio. Uh, something happened here just a few moments ago. Mark, you're the one that said it. You've been waiting four years for this to happen, and uh, there was an embrace between our two former attorneys general. <laughs> that that's something that I. I, I wondered if I'd ever, you know, have the chance to see, certainly in this uh, environment. Well, we worked very closely together, and we did a lot of really good things, but if it's been almost four years, we haven't even been able to talk. Right. You know, we I, haven't. I, you know, you wonder about that. I wonder how many people really understand, because I didn't, uh, that, for example, you had to cut off communications, block certain things, because you could have been called as a witness, and the two of you have not been able to, to communicate, John? No, we haven't, and it's been it's been hard because Mark was such a good friend and a mentor to me, but we we just couldn't because we would be um, probably charged with uh, what a witness tampering. Oh, Mark? yeah, they would have created a whole <laughs> lot of charges and made up some if they couldn't think of anything. So <laughs> my lawyer just said just don't have contact with him, and and we had. You know, virtually, no t- no contact. Yeah. I think yeah. we drove drove past each other one time. <laughs> yeah. Waved. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> waved at each other. Let's get back to uh, what unfolded yesterday and, and what is the future. We've had the chance to talk with Mark a few times since the charges were dropped against him. But as uh, we, we were just talking about, you probably heard as you were driving in, John, uh, Mark feels that he never really had his day in court. Boy, you did. And, you know, for, for good or for ill, uh, you walked out with a jury having... <laughs> exonerated you you know um i'm grateful when we saw the jury impaneled we saw mature and seasoned people and i didn't know until last night that one is a neurosurgeon one is an assistant principal um these are educated smart hardworking. i had never seen an experience with a jury that they were so uh, intent on every witness on every word and writing things down so we were encouraged because we saw the evidence coming in, even the state's witnesses. It would like that every day we'd say this could be a tough day because the states are putting on their witnesses. And we'd leave the day thinking, wow, what a great day. Every witness talked about good things about me. They didn't say anything bad about us. And with day after day, week after week, it was the same experience. And we thought, boy, we're glad this jury's paying attention because they're, they're diligent and I need them to consider carefully and really analyze these charges, and they did. And we were so happy to hear that they'd been paying attention and they didn't see anything that they thought was uh, provable of guilt, which is the, the American system Mark was talking about when I was driving in and listening to you guys on the radio, and I have a, gr- a lot of faith in that. But the problem with someone like me or any other defendant is the state has all these resources, and they can put things together in a way that makes it look wrong and if you don't have good counsel, I had great counsel with Scott Williams and Cara Tangaro and Brad Anderson, and they're great lawyers. They were able to put the case together so we could stand up and defend against all the might and power of the federal government and all these FBI agents, the state government, and the county attorney, district attorney. And we were so grateful for the result. Uh, one question that uh, actually I've had and a texter sent in uh, prior to our conversations even beginning, and they said, ask your, your two guests if they're – perspective on justice perspective on on the law and how a trial unfolds because both of you gentlemen have been so anxiously engaged in the law for so many years and at the highest level in the state of utah as the as we've referred to before and i heard it referred to with jeff sessions yesterday the top cop in the state have your thoughts have your perspectives has your have has your faith altered at all in the, se- in the system, and I'll ask John Swallow that first. Well, my faith in the system has not changed. Um, we have a good system. We have a constitutional system, and that's why I'm here today as a free man. Um, what I didn't understand was the perspective of the other side. I did not understand <clears throat> going something like 0 for 25. I don't know what the number was on motions that we filed. That every single one we thought had merit that were designed to protect my due process rights under our Constitution were denied. And my lawyer would consistently say, welcome to the other side. We lose all of our motions, but we have a chance with a jury. And I think that's a problem, and I want to look at that problem and from the other side. And I think there's a serious problem in this country with the, the imbalance of power between the prosecution and the defense. Every single person who's charged with a crime is 
is a citizen with rights and it's more important to grant that person their day in court and fair due process than for someone like happened in our trial. And I don't want to disparage anybody, but at closing, the prosecutor was saying to the jury, we just need three. We just need three. Just give us three like it was a game to win. And my attitude yeah. is it's not a game. It's about fundamental rights of an American versus the interest of the state for justice, but not for a win at all costs. And that's what's changed for me. That's the thing. You know, I, I, am, I have no legal background at all, but I always get concerned. Are the parties in a courtroom there to get justice for either the state or for the, the defendant, wh whatever the case might be, or are they just there for the win? Mark, what are your thoughts? You know, almost my entire life I've been in, involved in the prosecutorial side and criminal justice since I was a, uh, an attorney in the United States Navy, a uh, prosecutor. And prosecutors have a, a, a very important power that we give them. We, you and I hand them this power when an elected county attorney, for example, elected DA. Right. That is power over your life, your, your income, the ability to destroy everything, the ability to imprison you. Absolutely. And, and, it's, and, and it needs to be exercised so, so carefully, so, so cautiously. And the rules for that are, are extreme, that, that over and over again, prosecutors are told, this is not about getting a conviction. It should never be about guilt or get conviction. It's about a seek, a, seeking for justice. And that's as important to the prosecutor as it is to the defense attorney. That's their role. And that did not happen in John's case. Ultimately, it, it happened in my case because I had you know, Troy Rawlings prosecutors who realized he had a duty. He could not prove these facts. They were not true. He could not provide exculpatory evidence that we'd asked for. Uh, right. they, some girls should have asked for him in Johnson. He refused to do it. But so, so in that it. sense, that that's wrong, and that's that's a concern, and it's a greater concern. I mean, I I'm tweeting twisted justice. I'm that's going to be the name of my book, because so much of the process before you get to court, what it has done to our lives, when when law enforcement officers, FBI agents, state Department of Public Safety, can lie in search warrant affidavits, perjure themselves, sign sworn oath that this witness said X Y Z. And now when we get the evidence, it shows that he did not say X, Y, Z. The court, to sign off on that search warrant, has to trust the cop. Yeah. The DA has to trust the cop. When they're willing to lie, anybody, anybody is at risk to have their homes invaded, their, their communications attacked, to be surveilled improperly, to have, have agents come in and point their guns at your kid. That has to change. That has to change. And, and, and I think we only do that by telling the story, telling the truth, showing the proof, and holding people accountable for it. Yeah, I'm, I'm hearing and seeing emotion from both of you. And as you mentioned, John, a moment ago, this, this has created a real focus for you now to really look into this. Are both of you going to become cr crusaders on, <laughs> on making justice more of a priority? You know, I don't know. It's been, it's, it happened last night, Doug. So I, I'm still recovering from you know, the emotions of everything. So it's hard to say what I'll focus on as a crusade. But it's something I've noticed and something I didn't understand as an attorney general. Uh, the power Mark talks about a prosecutor has is an extreme power. Uh, the, the discretion that the court system gives to a prosecutor is incredible. And I read a quote several years ago when I was running for AG. I wish I still had it, but a good man at the AG's office gave it to me. He talked about the power of a prosecutor to destroy lives and the, the judicious use of that power is what people need to look for when they look at a candidate to hold that power in his hands. Because if they make a decision to charge, it's moving forward. And there are some safeguards like a preliminary hearing, but there are reasons sometimes that is waived. And if that's waived, I tried several times to get it back because I had former counsel that, you know, not to say anything good or bad about that person, but we decided for some reason not to do that. I couldn't get it back. And I didn't know, Doug, until the day before the trial, or maybe the week before the trial, or maybe a week or, or a half before the trial, what exactly it was that they thought I'd misled the FBI on in a, in a four-hour interview. We didn't really, really know that until after the state closed and we were arguing for directed verdict. How is that giving me the right to know what I need to defend against? You know, I've heard both of you uh, uh, say exactly the same thing with maybe a few different words. But basically, th there's nothing special about you. You're not above the law by right. any means, but you are a little higher profile than the average citizen. If this can happen, this kind of thing can happen to you. I I've wondered about that because I know both you guys. 
And I've wondered, holy cow, how would I fight something like this? It would just, I mean, my finances would never recover. My career would absolutely be ruined. And uh, are both of you, I mean, where do, where do you go from here? First of all, I, I would disagree with the career ruined. I, I, I saw last night as a complete exoneration. And I, and I want the public to know that I never would have worked for Mark Shirtliff unless I thought he was an honest man. And that while I worked for him in the AG's office, I didn't see him do things that I thought were wrong. Or I wouldn't have worked for him. So I think it's a little unfair that Mark didn't get his day in court, although I often ask myself I wish if, if I wished I were him because I wouldn't have to face a trial like I had to face. But I believe the exoneration last night was an exoneration for the, his administration and my administration. Now, it's not that I feel like I was a perfect attorney general or a perfect chief deputy. There, there are, th I was naive, and I did some things that I wish I hadn't have done, but nothing with any intent to be dishonorable in any way to the, any office I held, and I believe the same for Mark for the time I worked with him in the AG's office. And I want the people to know that even didn't he, though he didn't get a chance to be exonerated by a jury like I did, I believe that he's innocent, like I believe and know I'm innocent. And I think that's important to say. Mark. I appreciate that, John. And, it, and it's actually to the contrary. We were careful to the contrary to, be, to put integrity uh, at the top of our list. And so that's what was so hurtful. Yeah. Uh, regardless of what this did to me, just, just to, to hear that attack about, my, about our integrity and truthfulness. But I want to say this. You mentioned about what, what, would, what other people have, don't have the resources. I've been contacted by a lot of people. Say, well, you, you know, you do this as attorney general, and so it's about time you get your due up, you know, come up. And so we, we tried very hard. Our standard was very, very high to, to, before we investigated or prosecuted somebody. But, but the fact is, this is going on. People's uh, rights are being abused all the time. And as soon as I can get our family back on, out of bankruptcy and back on track financially, uh, I would really like to be able to take some pro bono cases to step out there and help people who, who can't afford uh, uh, the, the kind of attorneys that we both have. And, uh, and I tell you, Snow Christensen and Martin L. Rick Van Wagner, and, uh, they were all just a outstanding attorneys, but they're expensive. <laughs> Yeah. And, uh, and and something like this, that we had to. We had to do it. We had to fight for it. And we had to be able to pay those fees. Right. I'm glad you're getting yours back. I, I well, don't. I mean, I'll, I don't know. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. And, boy, that's another interesting thing. Because of the situation that John went through, being exonerated by a jury, there are some possibilities there. The fact that your case was dropped, that's a different set of rules. But right. you're both facing basically the same charges. You both now are not facing those charges anymore through right. different circumstances. But you both have a pile of uh, bills. How much do you owe, Mark? I Right now, one of my attorneys is $800,000. How about you, John? I, I haven't done the math, and I've made a commitment as a <laughs> lawyer never to commit math. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's more than that. But I, it's I'm a lot. Quite, I mean, imagine just the, just the, this last month. Yeah. The, yeah. The, yeah. I've tried cases. It's, it's, a, it's almost a 24-7 yeah, deal, and you've got three great attorneys working. It would be you, safe so. to say between the two of you, you're over $2 million. It's, it's several million dollars. Then you're throwing the fact million. that the, the state paid $4 million for that. <laughs> what I call kangaroo court. Um, wow. And I only call it that because it was always going to be one-sided. They knew that from the beginning. We could never have get our story before the legislature. You never had a chance no. to talk about it because we were facing criminal charges. No. I, John won't go that far, but uh, it's the whole thing needs to be examined. I called it that. investigation. My lawyer called it good. investigation. That's what it was. <laughs> you know, both of you in, in conversations, either on the air or in, in private, and, you know, I, again, I've known both of you. We've had lunches together and so on. But both of you have mentioned that in hindsight, you look at some of the things. John, you already alluded to this, that, you know, oh, wow, I look at that now, and yeah, okay, I wish I hadn't done that. And, Mark, you said the same thing to me. As you do look back, though, is there anything that you'd like to kind of splain to the folks? You know, like, Mark, you got some splendid to do, and, John, you got some splendid to do. A anything as you look back that you go, you know, I'd like the folks to understand this because, you know, in hindsight, I wouldn't have done it the same way. Well, let me ask that two ways. First of all, just this, you know, the whole story that, that I, on, on Jensen's dime, was, we were, were wined and dined at this luxurious resort for all this time, and, and then we repaid him by threatening and extorting him. And it, look, I was down there for a couple of days. My, my friend Tim Lawson invited me down. He, he passed away during this and could not take the stand either. He said he was paying for it. Go down and write your book. There are, there are scores of witnesses 
in the file that, of course, they never called. Yep. Who were down there said, Mark Shirley, all I saw him is writing his book down here. Mark Shirley, these are the so-called money guys, of Jensen's friend. He never asked me for money. I never gave a camp. And by the way, we didn't get any campaign contributions from any of these folks. <laughs> right. Wow. And so there was, there was no extortion. There was nothing like this. this and so here's my, here's my confession. Not only naive, but I have to admit, I, I, think, it, I think it was an arrogance on my part. I, I, I told myself, I'm above reproach. No one can, no matter what you give me, campaign contribution, whatever our relationship is, that will not affect my judgment or what I do with you. And so I could, I could put myself in a position where, yeah, there's this guy who's a, who's a convicted felon. And even though our office was not supervising him, he wasn't on probation with our office at the time, Mark Jensen, it put me in a position where he could make up stories. And I, and I shouldn't, that, so that appearance of impropriety is something that if I had just said, look, I, I know I can't be bought, but... People can say things now, and, and, and they can even, even knowing that, that the, the guy was a liar, the prosecutor still put him on the stand in John's trial for hour after hour after hour and, and suborn perjury and let, him, and let him lie. So that's what I would say. I, I, I should have been more humble and realized that, that there are people out there who, who might want to take advantage of, of, of any situation and make up stories about you. John Swallow, anything you'd like the folks to know? You know, the, the difference between Mark and me on this is that I, I had the opportunity to go to trial and have the state put all of its evidence out there and try to convict me, and it wasn't believable evidence. And so uh, I've already said that, you know, I think every one of us can look back about every week and say, God, that was a dumb thing to do. I do that all the time. And, and, <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. but to take and criminalize that type of behavior is what has been so surprising to me in this case in, in the case against Mark and the case against me and I you know I you talked about the future and and I believe I believe that there is nothing I couldn't do now in the future because I've been able to go through this experience and I and we're better people because of it Doug it was very hard for yeah. my family I mean yesterday was excruciating for my kids as I sat with them and said you know even though I'm innocent I, I could be led away in handcuffs tonight and had that emotional meeting with my kids and my wife and said, I'll be okay, I'm strong, you take care of your mother. Very emotional. And then go to the other extreme and say, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Praise the prayers of all the people who've prayed for us for many years. We have felt sustained by that, our friends and our neighbors, uh, having a great jury and a great, great attorney team. I, I'm just a grateful man. I don't hold any ill will or vengeance in my heart. And I think that's just a blessing from God. You know, Mark, uh, you, you told me something like that once. You said, you know, I've had a very frank conversation with my kids and my family that, you know, I don't know where this is going to go. I have every confidence that it should go this direction. But you've, you've had conversations with me before when you were considering running for the Senate and so on about some of the fragility within your family and with, you know, your daughter and so on. It, are, are some of your family members, I, I'm trying to think how to word this, are, are they going to get over this? Are they going to be able to deal with it? You've talked about your daughter wanting to go to court, wanting to be by your side, and you're actually criticized for dragging your daughter in there with you. That's a tough one. My, my Annie, she was a kid, really, um, 17 when stormtroopers come in with guns and, and vests and yell and scream at her, march her down the hall. You, she tried to hug her brother. You know, get away from him. Shut your dog up or we'll shut their dog up for you. I mean, it's just horrific, mean, unnecessary. And, and I, you know, I love cops. I love law enforcement. We, I've supported them my whole life. But if, for, for, for people to do that, and she has had problems with it. She has been in counseling. She's had medication to this day everyone in my family even though the only two were there and by the way they knew I wasn't there and they still went in and did this as a media show knowing I wasn't there treating my family like that everybody every time a car comes down our cul-de-sac a lot of people turn don't realize the cul-de-sac yeah. there's a parking lot behind us for the ball fields if someone's sitting out there I have I to chase them off go find a room you know kind of thing but it at the first thought is are they, are they, is it the FBI? Is, are they, are they listening to us? Are they, we know they surveilled us for weeks. Oh, yeah. Are they following us? Are they listening to our conversations? Are they coming again every knock on the door? It's wow. triumphs. It's PTSD, I think. And, and, um, I'm a big tough guy and it's hard for me, but it, it, I see it in my kids and, and I love them and, and they stuck by me and they were supportive and uh, celebrating now. But there are some issues I think that, 
that some of them will be dealing with for a long time. I don't know what your time frame is, gentlemen, but could you stay with us for one more segment? And uh, believe me, this has to be important to hijack the movie shows. I'm going to say, I always thought we were going to talk about movies. You know how much I love that. I, I look at what your, your reputations have survived and the fights you've had. Now you've got to face the movie show. So let's, uh, let's hold on here for just a second. We'll take a brief break. And we do have that sound, right, Mark? Okay, because one of the specific questions that I asked, and I did not call Mark Sessions Jensen. He called me on the air. And I asked him uh, several times, you know, is, is this a matter of vengeance? And uh, the, the tape we have will be most interesting. <laughs> 